Hi, well, um, I'm Garth Cumberland. This is Vivian, my wife. Um, this property's not ours now, but I first bought it in 1975, and it was a completely clean grass property at that stage. We're in the King Country. We're very close to State Highway 3, and we're just adjacent to what's known as the Eight Mile Junction, which is halfway between uh, Tigawiti and Piu Piu. One of the first things that I did when I purchased this property was decide that it needed a few trees. I had had some experience on, um, in the north, in, the, in, in Northland and in near Auckland with agroforestry. So I um, decided to pursue my interest in agroforestry, bearing in mind this is 1975, <coughs> when agroforestry was still a really untested and very new concept. And hence these trees that you can see around here um, are an example of those. Uh, these trees now must be around about 20 years or 22 years of age probably. Um, we planted a paddock a year from 1975. That was a roughly four hectares or five hectares. And we refined the technique of agroforestry during that period. The property we actually sold after about 25 years, which is very clear, very close to uh, the year 2000. Uh, but we retained the rights to harvest some of the older trees, which we have subsequently done since uh, 2000. That was in about 2003. Uh, the returns that we got from this agroforestry uh, management technique were not all that brilliant, but they were positive and they were exciting. There were some beautiful big trees and some very big pruned stems. The returns in the end worked out at something around $20,000 per hectare taxable net to us. Over that period that we were growing these trees, in conjunction with Forest Research Institute, we realised in fact that agroforestry is not the best way to grow fibre or to grow trees or grass. Uh, and nowadays I wouldn't be doing this sort of technique again. I don't do this technique again. The concept is much better to bring all the trees together um, and rather than ending up with 120 or so stems per hectare to have something approaching 300 stems per hectare. In most areas of New Zealand, certainly here in the King Country, that's a good, a very good um, population to harvest. So you can bring the trees together, have a smaller area in probably what we might call true or pure forestry and in fact keep the more flatter land uh, for the pasture and for the ag agricultural component of a farm property. Um, now just back to the um, agroforestry that I mentioned earlier and I commented that it did return around $20,000 taxable per hectare to, uh, to us. Um, it, it's my belief from do, having done a little bit of forest modelling that had we used the technique of um, bringing these trees closer together and actually growing true forestry on the steeper and marginal lands, um, while as I said retaining the uh, flats for agriculture and for more intensive grass use, grass production, that we would probably get something approaching um, between thirty and forty thousand dollars per hectare in that market back in 2003. Now when in fact you get that sort of money from relatively marginal lands, which is what this, uh, this land is here, the, the steeper slopes, the um, lower producing grasses, the slopes that are prone to um, slipping or erosion of some sort, then it makes this agricultural component on a normal farm, uh, makes it make immense sense and is really well worthwhile. There can't be anything better for a farmer to diversify into today, in 2012, than trees. What with fuel prices where they are, global warming where it is, the need to conserve soil and prevent soil erosion as it does, um, the potential to use trees in fact for fuel and so on, all of these things are pointing to and reminding us all, all of the um, absolute shortage of trees in the world and the shortage of timber and the ultimate potential for it to be um, uh, you know, for, for any trees planted today to be extremely valuable at the time they come to be harvested. On this property I focused on radiata pine having carefully researched alternative species. I was concerned that to diversify into other species, A, not quite so much was known about their management, certainly this applied back in the 1970s and early 1980s when I planted here. Um, but and B, but B, there was the concern that the future markets may not be as strong, and yet 
and sorry, by comparison, there was a really great market for radiata and there were people that were lo looking constantly looking over the fence at any mature radiata stands and wanting to purchase. Um, however, I now have a very open mind about alternative species. I believe that and know that there is a lot more uh, data known about the management of the um, species or the strains of alternative species so that they are now very productive seedlings that we always can, we can always buy and they seem to have a place to fit into as specialist to, to produce specialist t timbers which of course um, can give the, the variety uh, from radiata pine for New Zealanders but which are probably better known overseas whereas radiata pine is not that well known overseas. I, I must say that um, when I came to plant this property, I had already had some experience with agroforestry, as I mentioned earlier, um, and with planting trees and managing them in a agricultural or farm situation. So it was not completely new for me, but in order to build up that knowledge, I have always been very deeply indebted to the Farm Forestry Association, um, being incredibly impressed by the availability of information uh, from that organisation through the field days it has, its annual meetings and conferences and through the magazine that it produces. It's interesting of course after I'd got going on this property and had a series of new plantings of agroforestry that were somewhat, um, somewhat uh, experimental, the agroforestry organisations and the local agroforestry branch spent quite some time at various field days debating and talking about the things that were going on here so it very much was a two-way flow of information which I was absolutely delighted about but I think the important message is to any farmers who are, have got a little bit of steep land something like this marginal land potential for trees is probably absolutely magic absolutely phenomenal but if you're at all apprehensive about information and the source of information and the reliability of it then join the Farm Forestry Association and take part in some of local activities and field days in particular and it's an immense help. I'm often asked what if I came to this King Country property again as I did in 1975 what actually would I do to what was then an all grass farm but now having had the experience of 25 years of or nearly 30 years of growing trees on this property. Uh, in brief I would First of all, pick up my um, and mark out and fence off the marginal land on the property, the land that um, has a risk of erosion, the land that is steep, the land that therefore is quite um, unproductive or relatively unproductive. Um, I, would, I would think very carefully about the fencing of that land. It's got to be fenced off, but you've got to also make sure that you retain access for livestock and the pastures around it and so on. I would then I would then run the most efficient forestry block on that marginal land that I could um, depict or, or see. Uh, that really involve, would, in brief, that will involve planting probably 800 or 900 high quality genetic trees, mainly radiata, but think about the advantage of diversifying into other species. Think about the aesthetic effect of just a few other species alongside, around or through radiata. In other words, let's not get too buried in radiata. It is not a bad idea to, to diversify. Um, but predominantly we're still thinking about uh, radiata in, in situations such as this. I would manage it, most definitely I would still prune it, even though pruning is um, not quite as valuable now as it used to be. I have faith that uh, it is still more valuable. The pruned log is greatly more valuable than the next log up on all of these trees. Um, and I still have faith that pruned logs, clear wood in other words, will have um, a con an ongoing and continuing advantage when it comes to harvest time and logs going out the gate. Um, and I would end up with around about 300 stems per hectare which with modelling, with experience and so on um, is clearly indicated as being the most valuable way of growing timber on these marginal lands in the King Country. Bearing in mind we're talking about diversifying into forestry on an all-grass farm, I would actually gradually plant areas probably every year or certainly every second year in order long term to plan for a complete cycle on the whole property where 
we're going to be able to harvest a small area each year and replant or plant an area each year. The other thing that we, of course, all of us as farmers know is that um, trees provide an, a really valuable shelter for stock, which it has immense uses in adverse conditions. The classic case in New Zealand, of course, is Canterbury, where there are lines of shelter stock, um, stock shelter, but even paddocks um, of trees and even open trees such as this agroforestry example here on farms um, can provide really useful shelter. When I first came here and started planting, bear in mind this was an all-grass property at the time, I was planting a, roughly a paddock a year. I planted within existing fences. But this spot here is quite a good example because high up on the hill there in front of that telecom tower is a really good example of what is marginal land and by my standards now would be an ideal um, situation for taking the grass out and planting an intensive forest crop. It seems to me to be excellent. However, one of the things that you must be really careful about, we must always carefully plan those marginal areas that we're thinking of putting into forestry, we must plan them from the point of view of access and egress for logs. But it's quite good because that basin up there is actually served by an internal farm track which certainly in the summer and on this property possibly in the winter could be, could be harvested because there is quite a, a good network of tracks that leads down the property out on, a, out on the river flats to State Highway 3. Again with planting, um, the forest areas or the marginal areas on a property, the planning should involve um, full consideration of the remaining agricultural potential of the farm, such that we're taking out, we can take out and put into trees sharp corners which are hard to, for perhaps to muster. Um, and so in fact the trees can contribute, the trees and the planning associated with the tree establishment can actually contribute to better farm management, raceways, a bit more metal and all that sort of thing. A lot of farmers say to me, oh I haven't, can't be bothered getting into forestry because I've got to wait 30 years before I can harvest. But in fact um, I've been involved in the forest consultancy business for the last 20 or so years and it has absolutely amazed me how many mid-rotation forests do change hands. They are, fairly, they are constantly on the market, constantly being traded and sold. In many cases they are passed on too to other members of the family. So a forest investment is really an incredibly valuable tool for a landowner or for a mid-aged person or, fam um, or couple who are wanting to, to decide how to pass on their farm uh, to their offspring. With some trees, um, some offspring are very happy just to take the trees under a forestry right. Um, one or other of the um, offspring may well get the farm and so on. What I'm pointing to there is, or what I'm stressing is, that there is this ability to use trees very effectively in succession planning um, and in reward and passing on the asset that a couple perhaps build up in a farm.